deep underground, in an undisclosed location, Dread Comics goes behind the movies, with the original, Muppet movie. The Muppet movie is a 1979 musical road comedy film and the first theatrical film featuring the Muppets. Directed by James Frawley and produced by Jim Henson, the film's screenplay was conceived by the Muppet show writers Jerry Jell and Jack Burns. An American and British venture produced by Henson Associates and ITC Entertainment between the first half and the second half of the Muppet show's third season, the film depicts Kermit the Frog as he embarks on a cross-country trip to Hollywood. Along the way, he encounters several of the Muppets, who all share the same ambition of finding success in professional show business, while being pursued by Doc Harper, an evil restaurateur with intentions of employing Kermit as a spokesperson for his frog legs business. In addition to the Muppet performers, the film stars Charles Durning and Austin Pendleton, and it features cameo appearances by Dom DeLuise, James Colburn, Edgar Berglund, in his final film appearance, Steve Martin, and Mel Brooks, among others. Notable for its surreal humor, meta-references and prolific use of cameos, the Muppet movie was released in the United Kingdom on May 31, 1979, and in the United States on June 22, 1979, and it received critical praise, including two Academy Award nominations for Paul Williams and Kenneth Asher's musical score and their song, Rainbow Connection. In 2009, the film was deemed culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant by the Library of Congress and selected for preservation in the National Film Registry. The success of the Muppet movie led to several other feature films starring the Muppets, The Great Muppet Caper, 1981, The Muppets Take Manhattan, 1984, The Muppet Christmas Carol, 1992, Muppet Treasure Island, 1996, Muppets from Space, 1999, The Muppets, 2011, and Muppets Most Wanted, 2014. The film begins with the Muppets sitting down at a private screening to watch a movie that tells the story of how they all met. Kermit the Frog lives a simple life in a Florida swamp. One day, he enjoys an afternoon playing his banjo and singing Rainbow Connection when he is approached by Bernie, a talent agent who encourages Kermit to pursue a career in show business. Inspired by the idea of making millions of people happy. Kermit sets off on a cross-country trip to L.A., but he is soon pursued by entrepreneur Doc Harper and his assistant Max, to attempt to convince Kermit to be the new spokesfrog of Harper's struggling French fried frog legs restaurant franchise. Unwilling to accept Kermit's refusal, Harper resorts to increasingly forceful means of persuasion. Kermit meets Fozzie Bear, who is working as a hapless stand-up comedian and Kermit invites Fozzie on his journey. The two set out in Fozzie's 1951 Studebaker. In an old church, they meet the rock band Dr. Teeth and the Electric Mayhem, and the band's manager Scooter, and they give a copy of the film's script to the band. Driving on, they meet and are joined by Gonzo and his girlfriend Camilla the Chicken. They trade in their failing vehicle at a used car lot, where they meet Sweetums. They invite Sweetums to come with them. But he runs away. Thinking he does not want to come, the others drive away, only for Sweetums to emerge and reveal that he had only run away to pack his things. The group meets Miss Piggy at a county fair, and she immediately becomes love stricken with Kermit. When Kermit and Miss Piggy meet for dinner that night, Hopper and Max kidnap Miss Piggy as bait to lure Kermit. When Kermit arrives at the designated location, Mad scientist Professor Craftsman tries to brainwash Kermit into performing in Hopper's advertisements, but an enraged Miss Piggy knocks at Hopper's henchman and causes Craftsman to be brainwashed by his own device. However, immediately after the fight, Miss Piggy receives a job offer and promptly abandons a devastated Kermit. Joined later by Rolf the dog and reunited with Miss Piggy, the Muppets continue their journey to Hollywood, but their car breaks down in the desert. Sitting at a campfire, the group sadly realizes that they will likely miss the audition the next day. Kermit wanders off, ashamed for bringing his friends on a fruitless journey, but some personal reflection rests towards his commitment. He returns to camp, where he discovers the electric mayhem have come to the rescue, having learned of their plight by reading ahead in the script. 
The Mayhem offer to drive the entire group the rest of the way in their bus. The group is warned by Max that Hopper has hired an assassin, Snake Walker, to kill Kermit. Kermit decides to face his aggressor and proposes a western-style showdown in a nearby ghost town. There, they find inventor Bunsen Honeydew and his assistant Beaker. Kermit confronts Hopper with an appeal to Hopper's own hopes and dreams, but Hopper is unmoved and orders his henchmen to kill Kermit and his friends. They are saved when one of Dr. Bunsen's inventions, Instagrow Pills, temporarily enlarges mayhem drummer animal into a giant, frightening away Hopper and his henchmen for good. Once the Muppets reach the Hollywood studio, they finally meet studio executive Lou Lord, who signs the Muppets to a standard rich and famous contract. They attempt to make their first movie as a pastiche of their journey. The first take goes awry when Gonzo crashes into the prop rainbow, and an explosion blows a hole in the roof of the studio. As the Muppets stand in stunned silence, a natural rainbow shines through the hole and onto the Muppets. Joined by other Muppet characters, the Muppets sing the final verses of the Magic Store, Rainbow Connection, Reprise, before Sweetums crashes through the movie screen in the theater, ending the film and catching up with the rest of the crew as they congratulate each other on their performances. The main obstacle the filmmakers were faced with during the development of the Muppet movie was whether the Muppets would transition seamlessly from television to film. In 1978, director James Frawley, Jim Henson, and Frank Oz filmed several camera tests outside London to test how the characters would appear in real-world locations. Austin Pendleton recalled that the film was shot on a very unhappy set, because Jim Frawley was very unhappy directing that movie. And I noticed that was the only time the Muppet people used an outside person to direct a Muppet movie. They never did that again. After that, it was either Jim Henson or Frank Cos. And I would have liked to have been in one of those, because those sets were very harmonious. But this was not. Eight, filming locations included Albuquerque, New Mexico. To perform Kermit sitting on the log, Henson squeezed into a specially designed metal container complete with an air hose to breathe, a rubber sleeve which came out of the top to perform Kermit in a monitor to see his performance, and placed himself under the water, log, and the Kermit puppet. He was also assisted in this operation by Catherine Mullen and Steve Whitmire. This scene took five days to film. Before this, no film had a hand puppet hacked with its entire body appearing on screen. That is, hand puppets were only seen from the waist up, and it became a major plot point to show Kermit with legs. To have Kermit ride a bicycle in a full body shot, the Kermit puppet with legs was posed onto the seat and his legs and arms were attached to the pedals and handlebars. An overhead crane with a marionette system held the bicycle through strong strings invisible to the camera, guiding the bicycle forward. The crane and system were out of the camera's frame of vision. Other shots required Muppets standing and acting in a full body shot. Specially made, remote controlled puppets were placed on the set and controlled by puppeteers out of the frame. A dancing Kermit and Fozzie Bear were operated by Henson and Frank Oz in front of a blue screen and they were composited onto a separate reel of the stage. Both of these effects and the bicycle effect were used again, and refined, in subsequent Muppet films. The closing reprise of Rainbow Connection featured a crowd of more than 250 Muppet characters, virtually every Muppet that had been created up to that point in time. According to Henson archivist Karen Falk, 137 puppeteers were enlisted from the Puppeteers of America, along with the regular Muppet performers, to perform every Muppet extant. Prior to the day-long filming of the shot, Hansen gave the enthusiastic participants a lesson in the art of cinematic puppetry. Amazingly, it did take just one day. The Muppet Show fan club newsletter answered the question of how did they do it? The response was there are 250 puppets in the last shot of the film and they're all moving. How? 150 puppeteers in a 6-deep, 17-wide pit, that's how. They were recruited through the Los Angeles Guild of the Puppeteers of America and almost every puppeteer west of the Rockies reported for pit duty. In September 1978, Edgar Berglund, Hanson's idol who appeared in a cameo role, died shortly after completing his scenes. Hanson dedicated the film to his memory.
The Muppet movie uses meta-references as a source of humor, as characters occasionally break the fourth wall to address the audience or comment on their real-life circumstances. In one scene, Kermit and Fozzie encounter Big Bird on the road, offering him a lift to Hollywood, but he declines, heading to New York City to break into public television, referencing the character's role in Sesame Street. In a particularly metafictional plot twist, Kermit and Fozzie actually give the screenplay to Dr. Teeth, who later uses it to find and rescue them after they have been stranded in the desert. Several classic cars were specially selected by Henson for appearances in the film. The most prominent were a pair of 1951 Studebaker Commander Coupes driven by Fozzie Bear in the film. One car was painted but unmodified and driven by a person in the front seat. It was used for long, traveling shots. The second car was driven by a person in the trunk, who viewed the road through a TV set. The television received its image from a camera located in the center nose of the car's front grille. This made it possible for Frank Oz to perform Fozzie Bear in the front seat, and have the character seemingly drive the car in close-up shots. This car is now on display at the Studebaker National Museum in South Bend, Indiana. Doc Hopper is chauffeured throughout the movie by Max in a 1959 Cadillac Fleetwood 75 limousine. The final car driven by the Muppets is a 1946 Ford Woody Station Wagon, famous for its wood panel siding and a valuable collectible. The film's music was written by Kenneth Asher and Paul Williams. Regarding the music's composition, Williams said, Jim Henson gave you more, creative, freedom than anybody I've ever worked with in my life. I said, you want to hear the songs as we're writing them? He said, no. I'll hear them in the studio. I know I'm gonna love them. You just don't get that kind of freedom on a project these days. Move and ride along, never before, never again, and I hope that something better comes along or shortened in the film, compared to their soundtrack versions, for continuity purposes. The latter, a duet between Rolf and Kermit contain references that the studio considered too mature for children, although the song appeared complete in the British theatrical and home video debut versions. In Finale, The Magic Store, a line performed by Kermit in the film is sung by Fozzie on the soundtrack recording. The film proved to be a huge hit at the box office during the summer of 1979 and ended up grossing $76,657,000 domestically, making it the seventh highest grossing film of 1979, and also the second highest grossing Muppet film after the release of The Muppets in 2011. The success of the film gave Jim Henson Productions an opportunity to release more Muppet productions theatrically. The film's successful theatrical release encouraged Lou Grade into furthering his own film distribution company, which later backfired with the massive box office failures of Can't Stop the Music, from Emmy, and Raise the Titanic, from IDC, both released by Associated Film Distribution just a year later. Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times gave the film three and a half out of four stars. In his favorable review, he was fascinated that the Muppet movie not only stars the Muppets but, for the first time, shows us their feet. Vincent Canby of the New York Times offered equal praise, stating that the film demonstrates once again that there's always room in movies for unbridled amiability when it's governed by intelligence and wit. Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune gave the film three and a half stars out of four and called it surely one of the summer's most entertaining films which does a fairly nice job of trying to be all things to all people. Which is not an easy job. Dale Pollock of Variety wrote, The Muppet Movie is a winner, script by Jerry Gell and Jack Burns incorporates the zingy one-liners and bad puns that have become the teleseries trademark, but also develops the Muppets themselves as thinking, feeling characters. Charles Champlin of the Los Angeles Times wrote, As you might well expect, it is hip, funny. Technically ingenious, fast-moving, melodious, richly produced, contemporary and equally and utterly beguiling to grown-ups and small persons. Katrine Ames of Newsweek stated, The Muppet movie is a delectable grab bag of influences, stories by Elf Frank Baum and Lewis Carroll, westerns, the Crosby Hope and Garland Rooney movies, as well as its own inventive devices. The result is a kind of that's entertainment. With a plot attached. Its charm, 
and success, lie primarily in its loving pokes at Hollywood conventions and in the lovable characters who do the poking. Leonard Maltin's annual movie guide found the film enjoyable, though he called the score pedestrian. The Muppet movie currently holds an 88% approval rating on Rotten Tomatoes with an average score of 8 tenths, based on 48 reviews. The site's consensus says the Muppet movie, the big screen debut of Jim Henson's plush creations, is smart, light-hearted, and fun for all ages. In 2009, it was named to the National Film Registry by the Library of Congress for being culturally, historically or aesthetically significant and will be preserved for all time.